We have the green. Uh, it's time for announcements. Uh, this week's schedule is on the screen. Maybe. Monday, August 9th at 6 p.m. is men's group. Meal will be served first. And Wednesday at 6.30 is prayer time. Wednesday, August 11th at 7 p.m. is board meeting. Uh, Sunday, August 15th at 6 p.m. prayer walk around the school starting at the elementary. See Wayne uh, for uh, more details. Are there any other announcements? Nothing going on. Kind of slow month, even though it's a good month. It's August. Oh, nobody likes August. <laughs> uh, we'll stand and sing our opening songs. of my heart I want to see you I want to see you open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see I want to see you. 
Today, as we come to you, may we realize that um, we have to learn to trust you. We have our own ideas, we have uh, our own plans, but we need to learn to trust you. We need to let you lead us and guide us. We need to learn to lean on you, and we need to learn to obey you and to walk with you every step of the way. Today, I'm asking, Father, you might fill our hearts with joy. As it says in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and Father, we need strength. We need to rejoice because you've given us a wonderful Savior, you've given us a wonderful hope, you've given us a blessed hope in heaven. And you've promised to be with us each and every day, you've promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And Father, today as we listen to your word, may you speak to our hearts, fill us with joy and the desire to serve you. And now, Father, we pray as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our children are excused to go to junior church at this time. Generally, weddings are joyous occasions. But strange things happen at weddings. I was doing one where we got to the point where we were ready to exchange rings and one of the bridesmaids exits the building. And the maid of honor says, just keep talking. Evidently they had forgotten the ring. <laughs> and then there's the one, and uh, I will not mention names, but I know if they ever see this they will know exactly who I'm talking about. In fact, everybody who was at the wedding will know who I'm talking about. This couple were uh, probably mid-40s or so. And um, I was doing part of the wedding. Uh, she went to church where I was pa uh, pastoring and his pastor was also doing part of the wedding. And we did not do a rehearsal and he said, now, or they said, uh, we're going to march in together. We've been married before. We're not going to have my father march me in and all that. We're going to walk in together. So do not ask who gives this bride away. But he tells me to ask who gives this couple away. So they come down the aisle and I'm standing there and I ask who gives this couple away. And the father is sitting there and he starts to stand up. But he knows he's not supposed to. His wife pulls him down and he sits there. 
She stares at me. She doesn't change the expression on her face. She basically says, Wayne, I told you not to do this, and I'm going to stand here and let you hang yourself. <laughs> we stood there for a few moments, and the uh, groom turned his head, and about three rows of singles stood up and said, we do. <laughs> they were exchanging their vows, and the other pastor was doing that part, and he goes to get the ring, and the... Maid of Honor just stands there. And he gets worried and he starts to take the ring off his finger. And about that time she piles her flowers on his Bible and they're falling down. He's leaning over there picking them up and saying we should have had a rehearsal. And she sits down on the stage. She takes her shoe off and takes the ring out of her shoe. <laughs> the vows have been exchanged. They're getting ready to walk out and the best man picks up a Stetson, black Stetson hat that was sitting on the front row, gives it to the groom, he puts it on his head, his bride is on his arm, and they march out to the music with Gene Autry singing, Back in the Saddle Again. <laughs> <laughs> Strange things happen at weddings. No matter how hard you work at rehearsal, to make sure everybody knows their responsibility, what, when, where, and how to do their part, invariably something's going to go wrong. So I tell couples, regardless what happens, just remember that's the way we planned it. By the time a couple comes to the pastor, they've determined they are going to get married. In fact, they've even determined when they're going to get married. And they come to you for premar premarital counseling. Well, not exactly. They don't come for premarital counseling. They come because you require the premarital counseling in order to marry them. While some couples should not get married, it's almost impossible to talk them out of it. They think they're in love. They have no idea what it takes to make a marriage last. And I'm probably sure that all of us to some extent were that way when we were young. I heard the other day from the financial guru, Dave Ramsey, that it costs... In America, last year, it cost $28,000 for a wedding. That was the average cost of a wedding. Now, if you get married as often as Liz Taylor did, that starts to add up. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a lot of planning that goes into a wedding, a lot of decorations, a lot of flowers. There's the tux, and there's the gown, and there's the invitations, and a myriad of details. And the young couple has spent a lot of time and energy and money and planning and preparing for this wedding. So I ask them this question. Have you spent as much time preparing for your marriage as you have your wedding? And after they sit there for a minute, I add, uh, you know, you, you could have a very inexpensive wedding. And if over the years your love grows for each other and this marriage becomes a strong marriage, you will look back on this day with a great deal of pride and satisfaction. But on the other side of the coin, if you spend a lot of money on this wedding, even if you spend a lot of money on this wedding, and uh, down the road it crashes and burns, you're going to look back with a lot of heartache and disappointment. This morning, we're talking about a wedding. And to better understand a wedding of that day, in Jesus' day, uh, I I'm going to look at uh, you know, uh, what uh, Barclay in his commentary identifies as three stages of the Jewish wedding. First of all, there was engagement. This happened when the couple is small, okay? They may not have even no known each other. The parents get together and usually with a professional matchmaker decide who they're going to marry years down the road. You see, back then a marriage was more of a business deal than anything else. Now, would you have liked for your parents to have chosen who you were going to marry? I promise you most of us would not have married the person we did if we had of. But on the other side of the coin, let me ask you this. Would you have liked to have been able to pick the spouse for your children? Don't raise your hands. I don't want to know that. Uh, the second part was the betrothal. This would be similar to our engagement time. This happens as the couple gets close to their wedding. They're probably about a year away. There's uh, feasting and there's a ceremony. Though it's not officially that they're married, uh, it's binding. It cannot be broken except by divorce. This was a situation that Mary and Joseph found themselves in when they find out that Mary is, is pregnant by the Holy Spirit with the baby Jesus. And the only way to break it, the scripture says, by divorce. Now we have trouble understanding that because 
Well, a couple today may be engaged. All they have to do is give the ring back. There's no legal steps that have to be taken. And then about a year later, you have the marriage proper. It's a time of great joy. Uh, it's followed by, you know, a joint, everybody seems to join a great uh, festival. And there's a procession to the home of the newlywed. So a jo Jewish wedding was not only a joyful affair, it was a protracted affair. It would last a week, maybe even longer. It's no wonder they ran out of wine at the wedding in Canaan where Jesus performed the first miracle. So Jesus tells about a parable in Matthew chapter 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps and did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. So they're having this joyous celebration, all these festivities. It's kind of like a week of vacation for many people. They've set aside their regular duties and maybe even some religious obligations to attend the wedding. And the guests were expected to have a good time. And the couple would not go on a honeymoon. They would stay there and, and uh, welcome all the guests. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I'd prefer the honeymoon. It was a rather relaxed uh, affair. And there was a lot of food and feasting, a lot of music and dancing and celebration. There was no time set for the groom to come from his house to the bride's house to bring her back to his house for the wedding feast. But that was the high point of the wedding. When he came to take her to his new home, there was a great deal of pageantry and drama as a part of this event. And the bride would ask ten bridesmaids. Now, I don't know if it's always 10, at least it is in this story. Now, the bride would probably be, at that time, custom probably would have been mid-teens. So the bridesmaids were probably that age and younger. And they had a special task. They were part of this procession that was going to go from the bride's house to the groom's house. And since it was a dark, their job was to carry the lamps and to light the way as they went. But when the bridegroom came, it was going to be a secret, and it'd be a surprise to the bride and her bridesmaids. They'd be waiting expectantly. So that night they waited. They waited a long time. They waited patiently. They were tired from all the festivities. They became drowsy. They became weary. They dozed off. And the bridegroom would try to catch the bridal's party napping. But the custom required that they send a messenger ahead that would say, Behold, the bridegroom, come out and meet him. So they were alerted and they jumped up and they headed out to the street and they're ready for his coming. So in verse 7 it says, Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are gone out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. And while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I, I, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, the ten bridesmaids, they all seemed to like. They'd all been invited to the banquet. Now, there were a lot of celebration. A lot of people were invited. But I'm assuming not everybody got an invitation. But they did. They got a special invitation. They got a special invitation that said, you get to be participating in this grand occasion because you get to help escort the bridegroom or the bride and the groom back to his house. Now they responded to the invitation. Now Jesus told some parables where people were invited to a wedding that made excuses and did not come. But these were waiting. They were joyfully waiting for the bridegroom to come. And they took their lamps to meet him. There was anticipation. He delayed. They were drowsy. They became asleep. Now I don't think there was anything negative about the fact that they became drowsy and fell asleep. I mean, they could go to sleep and still perform their duties when the time came. But they'd fallen asleep, 
all ten of them, their lamps were burning. Everything was alike as you observed them. They slept. And the hours went by. Five lamps began to flicker and went out. Five bridesmaids were not prepared for the long wait. The cry came, the bridegroom is coming. And they weren't prepared to meet him. How tragic. To miss the one thing for which they had planned and hoped for for so long. You see, the wise were wise because they prepared for the future. The foolish were foolish because they had not taken extra oil. There was frustration that ensued. They wanted to borrow the oil. and They said, no, there would not be enough for both. And so you need to go out and find some. The only problem is they, uh, there was no all-night Walmart close by. And so they had headed out to find some. They missed the wedding procession. If that was not disappointing enough, when they returned with their lamps replenished, the door was shut. They couldn't enter the celebration. Now the custom of that day was to close the door after everybody got there because drifters may come by, strangers may come by looking for a free meal. Now I, I don't know about you, have you seen those times, you know, about Christmas time when you drive by a house and there's just lots of cars there? You know they're having a party. And I always keep thinking, you know, maybe I just go in there and join the party. They won't know who I am. I, you know, you know I, I can get away with it. I, I've never tried it. Have any of you ever tried that? <laughs> but that's kind of what they would do in that day. But the door was shut, and no amount of knocking on that door would let them come in. They missed the joy. They missed the celebration. Now, before I tell you what I believe Jesus is saying specifically about this parable to us, I want to kind of set it in context. This uh, scenario begins in the beginning of chapter 24, and Jesus and the disciples are on the Temple Mount, and they're looking at those massive stones there. They're magnificent. And Jesus tells them the day is coming when not one stone will be left on the other. And they ask a question. Well, when's that going to happen? And then they also add to that question, uh, what is the sign of your coming and what's the end of the age? Now some would say, well, that's two questions. When's the destruction of Jerusalem and when is Jesus coming back? And others say, well, you know, you got two, three questions. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jesus coming back and the end of the age. And I'm going to let you argue that one out. I, however you want to follow on that one, it's fine with me. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem took place about 40 years after this. At about 70 A.D., the Romans came in, they destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, they took, there's massive amounts of gold there, they took it, they flattened it, they took the uh, uh, things from the temple. It was tragic. And, and there's a lot of similarities between the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the age when Jesus comes back. Number one, God's people need to be prepa prepared. Number two, you don't know what's going to happen. Number three, it's going to be a day of judgment, a day of great suffering. So in Matthew chapter 24, I believe Jesus is talking about his return. And he says, but about the day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, the people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up unto the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how be at the coming of the Son of Man. So the first example Jesus gives us is that of Noah's day. They weren't prepared for the flood. Now Noah had been preaching for 120 years. For 120 years he'd been building that great big boat. And still yet they were unprepared. They ignored the warnings. Then in verse 24, he says, Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. Uh, but understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, they would have kept watch. He would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. So the second example he gives is that of a thief. You see, the thief has an advantage of coming when you don't expect him. I mean, if you've got the lights on, you're sitting there with the shotgun, he's probably not coming in the door, okay? 
But if you're gone and you've left the door unlocked, or you're asleep, and he knows that you're a, light, a, a tight sleeper, well, he may come on in. So there's that element of surprise. So when Jesus comes in, it's going to be a surprise, a time of shock, a time when people don't expect him. And then in verse 45, who then is the faithful and wise servant? Who the master has put in charge of his servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. Then he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of the servants will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour when he's not aware of, and he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus used an illustration of a servant who's put in charge of the other servants. He knows the master's coming back, but he's waited a long time, and he begins to believe, well, maybe the master's not coming back. At least the master's not coming back as soon as that one might expect. So he begins to do that which displeases the master. The master's not coming, so I can misbehave. That sounds like children, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think we're all guilty of that. And that brings us to the parable in Matthew chapter 25 we've been looking at. What is Jesus telling us? I think the first thing Jesus is telling us is that Jesus is the bridegroom. We, his church, is the bride. He's coming back. No one knows the day. But he's going to come back and take his bride to celebrate that great marriage feast of the Lamb. It's going to be a time of great joy and celebration. It's a day we've hoped for, we've prayed for, we've prepared for, we've longed for, we look forward to. It's a day when Jesus comes and we go be with him throughout eternity. Now, like the bride who spends a lot of money and time and energy preparing for a wedding, so we should spend a lot of time, energy, and money preparing for the day when Jesus comes for his bride, comes for us. The second thing we know is that Jesus is coming back. We just don't know when. So we need to live in a constant state of preparedness. Jesus said he didn't know. The angels in heaven didn't know. The disciples didn't know, preachers don't know, TV evangelists don't know, those with all their millennial theories don't know. Therefore, we need to be ready for his return. Back in 1530, that's what, about 500 years ago, Martin Luther predicted Jesus' return. He said, For it is certain from the Holy Scriptures that we have no more temporal things to expect. All is fulfilled. The Roman Empire is at an end. The Turk has reached his highest point. The pomp of the papacy is falling away. And the world is cracking on every side as if it's falling apart. You see, things looked like they were going to the dogs back then. And he said, This is going to happen. The only problem was it didn't happen. Now, three years later, Luther verbally thrashed an opponent named Stifel, who predicted the world was going to end at 8 a.m. on October 19th, 1533. Now, I'm going to guess that in those three years, Luther had learned something. <laughs> you can't predict the day when Jesus is coming. Now, I know we've been looking for Jesus' return for 2,000 years, and for some of us that may seem like a long time, but let me tell you, God's timetable is different than ours. The Scripture says a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years a day, so this is only a couple days for God. So we need to live with that sense of anticipation. He's coming back, and it could be today. Did you ever look up in the clouds and say, you yeah, I wonder if Jesus could come in that cloud. Now, I believe waiting for Jesus' return doesn't mean we stand around looking in the clouds all day. That old hymn says, we'll work till Jesus comes. I believe part of de demonstrating the fact that we believe Jesus is coming back means that we're going to work each and every day. We're going to be busy, prepared for his coming. 
And then Jesus tells us that we must be prepared for his return. I think we have to prepare for the long haul. We don't know how long. We just know it's going to happen. Now, as we wait, even if we wait a long time, we've got to be prepared. The ten were invited. Five, all ten of them accept the invitation. They were all waiting, and he comes. But then that's where the similarities cease. Five were ready, five were not. Five did not plan ahead. They did not bring sufficient oil for the lamps. You see, not everybody who sets out to meet Jesus is prepared. And then there's that point that we can't borrow things from others, particularly relationship with God. We don't get to heaven because of what others have and others do. I can't be saved for you and you can't be saved for me. I can't be one of God's for you or vice versa. And you might say, well, my grandma was a wonderful Christian lady. Or my spouse accepted Christ as Lord and lived faithfully for him. But your grandma or your spouse may have greatly influenced you and been a wonderful Christian example. But they are not the ones that determine whether you get to heaven or not. It has to be a personal decision. We don't get to heaven because of someone else's relationship. We don't get to heaven because someone else has been good. God has children, but God has no grandchildren. There's some things in life that cannot be borrowed. You cannot borrow holiness or trade for it. You cannot borrow relationship for God. It has to be our own. Our faith has to be ours. We can't borrow faith from other people. A life lived for Jesus is not transferable. Lost opportunities cannot be regained. There comes a time when buying the oil is past. And I want to talk for just a moment about this concept of buying oil. There's those who, who want to take the parables and try to make every aspect of the parable uh, allegorized to be symbolic of something. And so some have said, well, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Now, I have a bit of a problem with that because I don't think the Holy Spirit's going to run short one day. I don't think you're going to run out of it. I think he's eternal. He's God. He's infinite. And uh, he's not in short supply. I believe Jesus is saying there's those who thought they were Christians. They went through the motions they went to, even went to church. They looked good on the outside. They wanted what Christianity could offer. But it was not personal with them. It was not real with them. Now, I don't believe this parable is telling us that we're saved by our works. If it was, we could be saved by works and Jesus would not have had to have died for us. I don't believe this parable is telling us that we're saved because uh, we earn our way to heaven. If it were true, Jesus would not have had to die for us. I believe what Jesus is saying is that his return is going to be without warning. The point of the parable is simply this. Are you ready? Do you personally know Jesus Christ? And what a tragedy be for us to live our lives in anticipation of his coming only to be shut out because we had failed to make sufficient preparation. We failed to know him. Now, no man knows the hour. We, we like to predict things. We like to predict the stock market. We like to predict the weather. We like to predict earnings. But Jesus says you don't know when it's going to happen. But there will be a time when it is too late. Too late is a terrible verdict. The door is shut. The saddest words of all, the faithful are in, the door is shut. But you're on the wrong side. There's a finality in that phrase. The door is shut and it stays shut. There's sadness there. The door is shut. There comes a time when there's no more hope. The door is shut and cannot be opened. There's an old fable about uh, three devils who were coming to earth to do their apprenticeship. And so they're having an interview with uh, Satan who is the chief devil as you know. And he's asking them what they're going to do. And the first one says, I'm going to tell people that there is no God. And Satan says, well, you might deceive a few. But people understand that there's a God. And the second one says, well, I'm going to tell them there's no hell. And Satan says, well, you may deceive a few. 
But people understand intuitively that there needs to be a punishment for sin. And the third one says, I'm going to tell people there's no hurry. And Satan says, go. You will ruin people by the thousands. You see, one of the most dangerous and devious of all deceptions is the fact there's plenty of time. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. Jesus may come back this week. You or I may die and go to meet him this week. We will at some point meet him. The question is, are we ready? If you're not, we invite you to come as we sing our invitation hymn. Shall we stand as we sing?
morning I'm going to talk about gladness. And in the Psalm 122, 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The psalmist was glad when he was invited to the house of the Lord. The early disciples of Christ broke bread with gladness. The time of communion offers such an opportunity. We come not because it is required. We come not because it was the proper thing to do. We come not because others beg us to do. We come also because we are glad that our Lord has given us an invitation and it is joy to come into his presence. And this happiness that is revealed here is a reflection of that greater happiness which awaits them who love and serve our wonderful Lord. We have a weekly appointment with our Lord and we should prepare for it. Our bodies, our minds, our hearts should be prepared lest we blunder unprepared into the Holy One. And as we wait in that presence, let us ask and receive divine forgiveness. Let us approach the table in humility and partake with thanksgiving. We must never allow the communion service to become meaningless routine. Each partaking must be a fresh encounter with spiritual reality. The vitality which uh, Christ's presence affords should cause our hearts to rejoice each time we partake. And to his presence we can bring our burdens, our cares, our spiritual needs. It is here that we can exchange our care for peace and sorrow for joy. Then we can say with the psalmist, thou hast put gladness in my heart. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we can come around this table this morning to partake of this meal, symbol of the broken body and shed blood that Jesus suffered on that cross for us. And he did this for the forgiveness of our sins. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now sing, I will arise. We will be released by, dock, uh, by the docket, by Rose. For those attending on live stream, thank you for attending. And uh, hopefully you got something out of it. So let us sing. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well
I'll be 